Welcome to worship with us today. Please know that whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at First Congregational United Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We are grateful you chose to be with us for worship today. Even though we are not gathered together in this sanctuary, this physical space, I like to think of us having a watch party and that we are joined by longtime and new friends as we worship together. Today, I would like you to imagine one person you miss seeing and consider sending them a note or email saying you miss them. Or think of some you, someone you would like to share this worship experience with that does not attend our church and send them the link inviting them to join us in worship. Friends are not forgotten, and new friends might be made. Let us now enter our time of worship together. Please join in the call to worship. In a world where violence seems to rule, we commit, O oh God, to small random acts of peacemaking, where people are oppressed because they look, act, speak, think, or love differently, we will affirm their freedom. Where people are exploited because they lack the strength or resources to refuse. We will seek to create alternatives. Where people are controlled through threat and fear, we will offer safety and hope. Where people believe their violence and power give them the right and ability to act as they please, we will call them to account. Wherever violence is done to another, through physical force, manipulation of truth, or the subtle workings of power, we will opt out, we will speak out, and we will stand out in opposition through small, random acts of peacemaking. Theologian Frederick Buechner writes that for Jesus, peace seems to have meant not the absence of struggle, but the presence of love. The presence of divine love is strong enough to hold all our struggles. We help carry the burden with love when we pass the peace to one another in worship. So in that spirit, we join our voices and say, may the peace of God be with us all. Here on earthly powers excelling, God receives. 
us join our hearts and minds together in the unison prayer of confession. Our, our Creator, Creator and Sustainer, we confess that we are not always strong like the trees planted by the water's edge. Sometimes we are weak and indecisive. When the first big wind comes, we lean and break. We plot revenge instead of letting you fight our battles. By our silence and busyness, we let wickedness and ugliness fester and flourish. Today, God, forgive us when we covet and lie and when we get caught up in things that displease you. Heal us, direct our paths, and be for us the peace we so desperately crave. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. God comes to those who welcome even a child in the name of Jesus. We receive God when we receive Jesus and the children he loves. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hello, everybody, and welcome. It's so great to have you here. Welcome, everybody. Now, you might be wondering, Jeff, where are you? Well, I happen to be in the middle of a wheat field. It's through Zoom, but I'm in the middle of a wheat field. And you might be thinking, a wheat field? Jeff, why are you in the middle of a wheat field? Well, it's because I wanted to share a childhood memory with you. I wanted to share a fond memory I had of growing up on the farm, okay? Because about this time, maybe in August and September, we would open up the big barn and we would start firing up something called a combine, okay? And what we had in the barn was a, a, a combine made in the 1950s. It was a McCormick International Harvester Combine. And we only used it once during the year. So we had to fire it up and get it started and we'd drag it out of the barn and we would get used. And, you know, instead of me trying to explain it, I found a video of a McCormick International Harvester Combine in work. Now, this is not the harvester that um, I have, we had when I was a kid and the man on the, on the combine is not my father, but to give you an idea of what a combine does and how it works, if you've never seen it before, I'm going to show you a video. Okay, so hold on a second. We're going to show you a video of a combine working. <laughs> Okay, so that was a, the same kind of combine that my dad used to use on the farm when I was a kid. Okay, what are some things you noticed about that combine, that McCormick International Harvester Combine, okay? What are some things you noticed from the video, okay? Oh, it's big. Yeah, it was a big machine when I was a kid compared to the combines they make today um, it was really small. They make them really huge today, but in those days it was a big machine and it's it's a big machine and made a lot of noise. Okay, oh, I'm hearing somebody say a lot of moving parts. That's exactly right. That's what I love to watch when my dad was using the combine. All oh, those parts moving around and, the, and those big pulleys and chain spinning and things going back and forth. It was really exciting. To give you a close up, I found a couple pictures. I'm gonna put those pictures up now so you can take a look from each side of a combine to see the different parts. Okay, do you see how some of those pulleys are really big and there's 
big chains running this way and belts running this way and all kinds of things. Okay, so you see that there's a lot of big parts on a combine, okay? So it was an old combine already when I was a kid. And every year my dad would take it out into the field and almost every single year he would come back before the harvesting was done and he'd pull it into the, the driveway and he would not be happy because something broke down on the old harvester combine, okay? And the thing was, rarely, rarely was the part that broken one of those big wheels or those big chains or those big pulleys that you see from looking at the combine. Usually he had to open up a couple panels and we had to crawl deep inside of the combine. And there was, in most cases, it was a tiny little part deep inside the combine that had broken. A tiny little part deep inside the combine that stopped everything when it broke. A tiny little part, okay? And you're wondering, why are we talking about that today? Well, I learned then when I was a little kid watching the combine and watching my dad bring it back because it was broken and then fixing it, that even the tiny little parts are so vital. It's not just the big parts that we need. It's the tiny little parts are just as important as the big parts. And if you listen to the scripture reading today, Jesus talks about how a child, a tiny child is just as important to God as very powerful adults, okay? He said to be with God, to be a part of God's kingdom, you have to love everybody as if you were loving this child. We're all a part of this big thing. And he's stressing to us that we can't just worry about the big things. We can't, oh, I'm going to fix something big. All right. We have to work to on the little things as well. Okay. We may not get as much attention when we're fixing those little things as if we were, look at me, I'm fixing this big wheel on the combine, okay? And may, we may not, may not get as much attention on the little things, but those little things are just as important as the big things. So when we go through life, we have to remember Jesus calls us to fix the big things and the little things. They're all important. Let's pray. Loving and patient God, thank you for the big things and the little things. Help us to remember that all are important in your eyes. Amen. All right. I'll see you next time. I'm going to head back out to the fields. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Every child in every land, Jesus holds them in his hands. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Hear these words from the Newer Testament, the Gospel of Mark. Chapter 9 Leaving that region, they traveled through Galilee. Jesus didn't want anyone to know he was there, for he wanted to spend more time with his disciples and teach them. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed. But three days later, he will rise from the dead. They didn't understand what he was saying, however, and they were afraid to ask him what it meant. After they arrived at Capernaum and settled into a house, Jesus asked his disciples, What were you discussing out on the road? 
but they didn't answer, because they had been arguing about which of them was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve disciples over to him, and said, Whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. Then he put a little child among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes not only me, but also my Father who sent me. Let us pray. May the words that come from our mouths and the meditation that lives deep in all of our hearts always be pleasing to our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. There are many days in my life that are seared into my memory, but none with more detail and emotions than the days our children were born. The ups and downs of becoming pregnant, the anticipation of their birth, and the role they would play in us becoming a family had me laser focused on this experience. I remember the days with both anxiety and hope. And then we brought those little angels home. And wow, did our lives change. Yikes. All of a sudden, every waking moment, well, actually every moment, even when I was trying to sleep, was focused on our new child or two. Their cries demanded our attention. Their diapers demanded our attention. Their upset tummies demanded our attention. Their hungry tummies demanded our attention. Their coos, smiles, and significant changes demanded our attention. It was all baby, all the time, or at least it seemed that way. But in my desire to have a family, or add to our family, it was all okay. It was okay to function with little to no sleep, go into meetings with throw up on my shoulder that I didn't know about, and accept the help of many members of this congregation or friends, friends from the past to provide these children with the best possible start they could have in this world. It was important for me to serve these children, to provide for their needs to grow. It was easy for me to serve them because I loved them and I wanted the best for them. I am not an oddity. Most families function in this way with newborns, infants, and toddlers, and sometimes even adult children. There's nothing, there's nothing flashy about that serving. It's mostly done behind the scenes. There's nothing convenient about serving, but serving is necessary. Our text takes us on a walk with Jesus and his followers. As they are walking, Jesus is continually teaching. Again, as he has done in the past, he tells those traveling with him that he will be betrayed and handed over to be killed. Unlike our text last week when Peter tells Jesus not to share that kind of information, the disciples just seemed to be dumbfounded by the words. There was no questions asked, no request for clarity. What we do hear in the text is that the disciples start arguing. As suggested in our Bible conversations groups, perhaps they thought they ought to start a succession plan. So the conversation is about who is the greatest. Once they reach their destination, Jesus asks 
the disciples, what they were arguing about, as if he doesn't know. My hunch is that he knew exactly what they were arguing about, which is why the next teaching he provides is a lesson on greatness. The definition of greatness for the disciples is probably not that different than what we experience as greatness in our world today. Greatness is often related to power with people or within a community. Financial wealth, popularity, achievements, or desired skills. These attributes are clearly what the disciples have in mind as well. Maybe it was who was the closest to Jesus, who was Jesus' favorite, or who had the best skills to carry on the work of Jesus. As Jesus so often does, he offers a different definition of greatness. His response, even though the disciples failed to disclose what they were arguing about, is whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. What does Jesus mean by that? Each of the disciples are trying to move themselves up the ladder with Jesus. They are trying to listen and learn. They are attempting to understand how to do miracles and plan to be right at his side when he is revealed as the king. What does he mean by being a servant to everyone else? While the disciples are still scratching their heads, Jesus Jesus follows with an example of what he means. Jesus sets a child among them, takes the child into his arms and says, anyone who welcomes this little child on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me, welcomes not only me, but also my Father who sent me. To understand the power of this statement and action, we must understand how children were seen in the time of Jesus. Father Lawrence Jagsfeld writes an interesting take on how children were perceived and included or excluded in Jesus' time. He writes... In the Mediterranean world in which Jesus lived, children held a different kind of status than they do in our world today. Today, we expect our children to grow into adults and to engage in a life of fulfilled dreams. This was not the case for parents of Jesus' time. More than half of the children born at this time never reached puberty. They died of diseases and of malnutrition. When children appear in the Gospels, they usually are used to convey a very important message. Such is the case in the passage of Mark's Gospel. Children had the free reign of the family compound. These people lived in extended families. Brothers lived with their brothers and their wives and their children. The eldest brother, or their father was the patriarch. The women lived in one section of the home, usually to the rear, where they were not so vulnerable to vagaries of passerbys. The women lived, the men lived in another room, usually near the front of the home, and were seen as the protectors of their women and children. The children roamed freely between the two areas and were often used by the adults to discover what was going on in the other rooms. They carried stories back and forth. They were the ultimate destroyers of secrecy as they had access to the whole house. The women could not keep secrets from the men and vice versa. If one wanted to keep a secret, it was paramount to isolate oneself from children. So when the disciples shoo the children away from Jesus, it was not simply a matter of giving them some quiet time. It was to protect him from gossip, from stories that the children could carry to the adults. 
Jesus welcomes the children in order to show that he has no secrets, that his life is open and above board. We Westerners tend to romanticize this story and make it look like Jesus had a special relationship with children, when in fact the story is to show that Jesus' special relationship was with all men and women as well as children. Jesus was authentic, trustworthy, and did not try to hide his private life. Allowing the children into his life was proof of that authenticity. We don't know whether the child Jesus invites into that circle is crying, screaming, laughing, drooling, or needed attention in any particular way. But the message he sends by bringing this child into the circle is the value of everyone. The child must be held and served. Some of the disciples who had left their homes to follow Jesus may have forgotten the importance of their children. They may have believed that it was no longer their job to care for anyone. They may have once been responsible or at least semi-responsible for in their world. When you welcome this child who has so many needs day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute, then you will understand service, Jesus says. Parenting or assisting in parenting is not an easy job. It is minute by minute, moments of service. None of those moments of service provide greatness recognized by those seeking power in society. However, every time we serve our children or anyone, no matter how small, we are having moments of greatness. Every time we baptize a child, we hold that child and their family in our hearts and prayers. We love that child on that day. But what about when a child makes some poor decisions? When our neighbor lives a different life than we fail to understand? Are we still able and willing to serve them? Do we always hope to be recognized and honored when we do serve? Parenting or dealing with others is not always the road we expect it to be. Serving is not always the road we expect it to be. Serving is an opportunity to put someone else's needs ahead of our own. It's not about being the greatest. It is an opportunity to show love, authenticity, and trust to those around us. I hope that we might all stretch our willingness to serve as wide as our arms will allow, putting every child of God in the middle of the circle. Help us to love all of God's children and want the best for all of God's children. Help us serve. The smallest act of love, a note, a smile, a wave, is an act of greatness. It's not always convenient, but it's always necessary. Amen.
be in prayer. Loving God, open us to come to this time of prayer with a seeking heart, a seeking heart that is open to the love you so freely offer as we look to be strengthened and nourished to care for ourselves and to do your work of loving the world. Sometimes our own desire for comfort and convenience gets in the way of our awareness of the needs around us. Open our ears, teacher of compassion, so that we might hear the cries of your hurting children, the cries of those who are hungry, those who are lonely, those who are afraid. Give us the words we need, teacher of justice, so that we might challenge the powerful and callous, so that we will be willing to bring together individuals separated by any means, and so that we might speak out when others are silent. Strengthen our hearts, move our feet, give us what we need when we are weary, so that we can face our work of serving your children with kindness and mercy and attentiveness. And now we take a few moments in silent prayer to offer all that we are and all that we need to you. Morning by morning, day by day, continue, God, to teach us your ways. And in community, we pray, as Jesus taught his disciples, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus tells the disciples that to be great, it must include service to all. They didn't need to worry about who was the greatest. They only needed to serve. This is a great reminder to each of us as well. There is no need to compete. We just need to serve 
in whatever small way we can. No service or gift is insignificant. We all have gifts to offer, and all service and gifts are valued. Gifts can be made via the website, through Realm, or by mail. pray. Generous God, we give you thanks for gifting us with so much, our lives, our time, and our possessions, signs indeed of your love for us. We offer these gifts as a sign of our grateful hearts and willing hands. We share what we have so others can experience abundance. In Jesus' name and through his example we pray. Amen.
these children are made in God's image. They are not perfect, and they have many needs. It's easy to love and serve them when we are their parents or grandparents, or when they are quiet and cute. They are much more challenging to love and serve as they grow. As they start making decisions, we question, act in ways that are unexpected, and maybe even act out in ways that could embarrass us. God, remind us of Jesus' words to serve, welcoming all, even those considered outcasts by us personally or as a society. It's not always convenient or easy, but it is always necessary. Go in peace. Amen.